Hello, everyone. Good evening. So glad you could join us on this Thursday. Um, we're really excited for the event we have planned. Um, so my name is Danica, and I am the Education Programs Manager at the Fraser River Discovery Center. And before we get started, I just wanted to make sure you all know that we are live streaming this webinar to Facebook, as well as recording it. So if you don't want to be recorded, uh, please make sure that your video is turned off. And then please also make sure that your microphone stays muted during the webinar itself. I'd also like to acknowledge that the Fraser River Discovery Center is located on the traditional territory of the Hunkamalem and Hulkamalem speaking peoples. Territory and acknowledgement, of course, is just one small part of reconciliation. So please take a moment to think of other ways that you can participate in reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. And tonight we are honored to be hosting Dr. John Reynolds to talk to us about iNaturalist in preparation for the upcoming City Nature Challenge next weekend. Um, he is the chair of the Committee on the Status for Endangered Wildlife in Canada, or COSWIC, a professor and Tom Buell BC Leadership Chair in Salmon Conservation at Simon Fraser University, and a top submitter of observations on iNaturalist. He'll be giving us an overview tonight um, on how to use iNaturalist, as well as some of the cool features of the site. He's then going to talk a little bit about the role of iNaturalist in conservation, and there will be time for questions at the end. So you're welcome to write any questions you have in the chat, and I can ask those to Dr. Reynolds at the end of the talk, um, or there'll be an opportunity for you to turn on your microphone and ask those questions yourself. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. John Reynolds. All right, well, thank you very much, Danica, and I really appreciate the invitation from the Fraser River Discovery Center. This is the second event I've done um, with the organization. I led a, a, a walk about on, on uh, salmon and salmon uh, uh, a few years ago uh, with a number of people in an event that uh, the organization put on. And so it's, I'm always happy to talk about one of my favorite things, which is community science. I will, um, so I'm going to start with, I'm just going to share my screen here. If I can see what I'm doing. So I just have a few slides to start and um, and then I'll take you live onto the site so we can see how the site works. And then at the end, as Danica said, we can uh, give some examples of conservation uh, uses that have been uh, made of um, community science. And uh, for that, I'll be heading back toward my, my, um, my slides. <clears throat> so community science is a way basically of empowering people to enjoy uh, the outdoors and uh, with a, a camera or a phone or, or whatever, a device you want to record nature and um, it's a great way to find out what is where uh, right now so new discoveries would be made all the time of threatened or invasive species for example often by people who don't know what they are when they first see it but they put the photos onto the website and other people see them and and um, and discover uh, and help with the identifications and discover that they're there it's also a, a good option for documenting range shifts over time for example, in relation to climate change, we're certainly going to see that happening as the uh, popularity of community science grows. And uh, frankly, it's a lot of fun. And uh, that's a big part of it for most of us. Uh, this is a hobby of mine. I, I, uh, <clears throat> I, certainly, there are lots of other things that I do in my day job as a professor at Simon Fraser University that are not as much fun as this. So it, it is fun uh, for uh, men for myself and for about 2 million other people who are using the uh, platform iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is the world's largest citizen science uh, or community science platform. And you can see this exponential increase in observations. And in fact, I will encourage you just, if you read off the axis here, it looks like we had about 55 million um, observations in, uh, as of 2021. Um, that number has increased by about um, 40 million actually since then. So it's really been taking off. And so these are the number of observations. That means basically photos, or in some cases, audios that people have uploaded uh, to the site. <clears throat> Oops. Okay, and I'm, so I'm gonna leave it there actually, and, and I will take you to the site. 
So let me put, put this away for a moment. And so um, can you see my, um, I'm getting a message about screen sharing paused. Are you able to see that still okay, Danica? Do you see a map? Not quite yet. It seems to have lagged for a moment. Okay. Um, perhaps I'll stop the share and restart it uh, just yeah. to see what we're doing here. So there we go. Share screen. Looks you can see a map. See yeah. a map. Okay. So um, this is um, the red rectangles mean that at least one observation has been um, put into uh, that location from somewhere up by somebody. And look at those number of observations. 94 million observations now. So it was only 55 um, as of 2021 that I, as I showed you. And you can see that collectively people have documented um, about 344 species. And that's by just over 2 million people who have um, been involved as uploaders. And this number identifiers, I hope that you can see my cursor, 271,000. These are people who go on the site and they can see the photos or listen to the bird call, for example. Uh, on the audio, and they will uh, help with the identification. They will confirm the identification if the person knew what it was, or they could uh, offer an alternative. And uh, often they give very helpful comments as to as to why. So it's a really nice way to um, have what they call a community of naturalists doing this. I should say, by the way, this was um, um, is being run by the California Academy of Sciences and the National Geographic uh, Society. So it's pretty well supported and, um, and it's definitely the biggest game in town and in, in community science right now uh, around the world. And it's especially popular for bioblitzes, which are these events such as we have now coming up in, I guess, a week from the City Nature Challenge, which uh, Danica will perhaps mention a bit more later on. So it is the go-to platform for doing that. And I'll show you why in a moment. So um, Danica, I want to try something that I, I uh, like to do, which is if you want to just unmute, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to name any species of plant or animal. Just in the whole world or in our local area? Uh, it, well, it, it's up to you. Um, Let's go with a double crested cormorant. Okay, double crested cormorant. So this is the, I'm, I'm going to take you through the, the three buttons here. This is explore, and then we're going to do your observations and community. So I'm on the explore page and I will type double crested there you can see it finished type it auto filled it for me there's a double crested cormorant and here's the distribution of double crested cormorants as seen by iNaturalist interesting there's some way out here in the Bering Sea and you can you can zoom in I could say let's do greater Vancouver and so there they are these are the observations in greater Vancouver uh, that people have been making and I could, I can click on a random dot. So uh, let me zoom in a bit more. There they are. You can see them there. This is funny. You can see the two Iona jetties uh, here. There's the South Jetty and the North Jetty. And people have obviously been seeing lots of them there and along the Fraser itself. Let's look over a Fraser wreck, a river one. And so there it is. And we can click on this observation and this is what you will find. There's the photo that someone uploaded and um, this is a person who has already made 2,300 uh, observations. I can zoom in and see more precisely where it was right there. And you'll see that this person recognized it as a double crested cormorant. You can tell by the orange throat pouch here. We have three cormorants in British Columbia and that's the only one that has the red pouch. And another person has agreed with that and so has another person so because at least two people agree on with it it gets this green banner at the top here which is so-called research grade meaning that it's a verified observation okay that's basically what that means so that one's finished with its ids it's it's a good record and scientists can use this information download it for free the app is free by the way uh and um and that's how you get toward 94 million observations so that's the explore button. And uh, there are other things we can do. I won't bother, but you should play with this one. If you go to the drop down menu, um, oops, from over here, there are these filters. I hope you can see filters in the top right. So I could explore threatened species with these filters. And there are various options, um, ones that need ID, ones that are wild or captive or introduced. So threatened species, so invasive species can be 
filtered out that way as well. Okay, your observations is exactly what it sounds like. Um, so this is a summary of what you have seen. Uh, so here are my observations. And um, you can tell I live in the Vancouver area. And, um, but uh, I've done a, you know, a little bit of traveling. And one of the things that I like about this is that it's a good way to remember what you've seen. So if you forget, um, for example, um, the name of a, of a butterfly, say, in you know at spring we get the first one out you can't remember now what kind of um what kind of skipper did i see or blue you know you have an idea of it so then i could simply type i'm going to type blues actually um so that's a, a group of of um, butterflies and i'm going to say oh i remember i saw it in, in vancouver that is often uh often possible and i've seen 13 um observations of three species and then you can look at them and say oh yeah it was a it's an echo azure at this time of year. This is a very early spring type azure, or is it the silvery blue, or is it the Anna's blue? So I have to remember re relearn a lot of these every year, and um, and so this is just like a nice little catalog of what you've seen and a good way to remind yourself what what you've been seeing. So that's your observations. The third button I'm going to show you is community, and I particularly you can see there's lots of options. I'm going to projects. This is a key feature of the site. A project is usually a geographical location, like a park, something like that. Uh, it doesn't have to be. It could be about the, um, you know, the, uh, well, here's one called um, uh, migration tracker. So this is something else, but you can have ones, usually it's a, it's a spot, it's a location. So I'm going to go to, um, uh, where do we want to go? Let's go to Colony Farm, a regional park. Uh, it's on each side of the Coquitlam River. Um, just north of the Fraser. And uh, so let's go there. I'm hot spotting from a motel room. So I, this is a little slower perhaps uh, than I would like. I'll just give it a second. Hope, hopefully it will load or my phone doesn't lose the signal. Okay, it's giving me some options that sound like that. So there it is, Colony Farm Regional Park. So let me just tap on that and here it is. So this is a site that automatically will gather any any um, observation that's been mapped to Colony Farm. And so you can scroll down and there they are. That's Colony Farm. And uh, you can sort of see the trail system on it here and they're color coded according to whether it's a plant or a mammal or a bird, an insect and, and that sort of thing. And just as we did before, I, I can click on a random point here. What's that? Oh, no, thank goodness it's not one of mine. You'd think it was rigged. Isabella tiger moth. Um, you've probably seen them. They're out wandering around uh, uh, the spring. They, they um, boldly march around and uh, there it is. So somebody found it and two people agreed. So it's research grade and um, that's just got mapped there. Now, how does it get mapped there? Well, usually the way most people do it is they'll take photos with their phone. And as long as you have location services on, then when you upload it, it'll take the location data with it and you don't have to map it manually. You can do that, but I'll show you in a minute when we do a little demonstration. So I don't use, there is an app that you can have on your phone for my naturalist. I personally don't really bother with it. I just have an iPhone, I use iPhotos, take, use my phone as a camera, and then I go onto my laptop and then upload to my naturalist. So, that's a project. I'll tell you about one other one. Um, you can also have what are called umbrella projects. And so here's one, BC Parks. This is a program that I've been involved with, uh, working with uh, my friend Brian Starzomsky from the University of Victoria. We're in our fourth year collaborating with BC Parks on trying to find as hiring teams and looking for as many species as we can in all of British Columbia's uh, provincial protected areas. And as part of that program, we've created um, an umbrella project. And that is an umbrella, uh, as it sounds, that's a project that gathers smaller projects underneath it. So in this case, it scoops up all the observations that have been made in all of the parks. And there's our leaderboard. You can see Strathcona is really killing it here. 27,000 observations. There's some real keeners in that part of Vancouver Island. Uh, here's a uh, South Okanagan, Manning, and so on. And I can click on any of these and you can see them just as I did with Colony Farm. 
So that's that's a, an umbrella project. And this means that it's a one stop shop for people who work with uh, BC parks to find out what's in their parks, because there's just no way that they're going to be able to afford to hire enough biologists to get them uh, half a million observations. And, you know, and these are mapped and, and with photos and audios and therefore they are verifiable. So that's one of the real powers of uh, community science is just the sheer numbers of, of amount of information that you can get from it. So that's that's uh, the BC Parks program. And, and by the way, if you're ever in a, any BC provincial park, whenever you uh, upload to iNaturalist, it will automatically appear in the in the provincial park. So this is wide open to everybody. Um, all of the Metro Vancouver regional parks also have their own projects. So if you're in Colony Farm or any other regional park, automatically there's a site so that people can see what's in those regional parks. Okay, so that's that's the community. I'm gonna, the last thing I wanted to do if, before we talk a little bit about uses of the information is I'm going to do uh, an upload. On um, <clears throat> every page of iNaturalist, there's an upload button. And uh, so we'll hit the upload button and you can drag and drop observations onto it. So let me just move my screen over a little bit. Uh, these are photos I took with my phone in Belcara Regional Park a couple days ago. So I am just going to select them all and I'm going to drag them over and drop them onto the upload site. And I could have done 50 at once and I sometimes do. So if you're a, a heavy hitter, you can certainly do that. And the first thing I hope you'll notice is that it automatically brings with it the date and time that the photo was taken. So I didn't type that in anywhere. And it knows where the photo was taken because my location services were turned off, were turned on. So let's tap on one. And there they are. They're mapped to Belcara Regional Park. So it knows um, where they were. I don't have to map them manually. I can if I didn't have a GPS, but otherwise this works perfectly well. And if you use a phone, like a, a camera, a proper camera that doesn't have GPS, then you can just map them by hand. And there are also some apps you can get that will automatically put GPS locations onto your photos. So now, what are these things? There's no name on this. I think you all recognize this one, this time of year, great time of year. Uh, the certainly keeps the hummingbirds happy with our salmon berry. Um, suppose you didn't know what it was. If you tap on species name, I'm just going to tap it once. It's loading suggestions and it recognized it as a salmon berry. Okay, so it uses artificial intelligence to suggest what you've seen. And it says, see what it says? It's pretty sure it's it's in the bramble genus. And if it's not salmon berry, then it's red raspberry or trailing blackberry. It's sticking hard to the to the uh the, you know the close relatives. And if you say, well, I don't know if that's a salmon berry. If I tap on the view, there's a view button here. I can tap on this thing and it'll bring me up to the home page of Salmonberry. And so you can see photos of it. Uh, you can see when most of the photos are being taken. You can see, if you go to the map, you can see where it is. Now that's a good thing to do because uh, if it turns out it's only found in Australia, then you know you've, you, you're wrong, it's wrong, it made a mistake. So you can't believe everything you see on its on its suggestions, but this is a good way to double check. So we'll go back to it. Um, I'm going to accept salmonberry. Okay. Now let's see what this. You can see what we have here, right? A crab claw, and uh, we'll ask it what it thinks um, it is. And and see, this is interesting. It says we're not confident enough to make a suggest a recommendation, but here are our top suggestions. And the ones it's going with are red rock crab. Uh, I don't even know what a helmet crab is. Let's view this. Oh, looks like I should know what a hel helmet crab is. But uh, anyway, that's another suggestion. And uh, let's go back to it. And then it also mentioned, mentioned Dungeness. I think this is a red rock crab, although I'd feel happier if this had red, had black claws here. I'm going to leave it for now because I don't, you know, if you're not sure, you can just type crabs like that. And then you can leave it at that and somebody else can sharpen up the ID. Okay. So just a couple more quick ones. There's smooth cat's ear. 
uh, no flowers yet at this time of year. Oh, common cats here, yeah, that's what I meant. And uh, indeed it recognized that. And uh, here's one of our least favorite invasives, um, Holly from Europe. And uh, it better know what that is. It's pretty distinctive. So European Holly, fine. And then finally, uh, nice to see the new foliage on the uh, red huckleberry. And again, I'm gonna ask it. And uh, not surprised that we get that one too. So it's better for some things than others, okay? If you, if you put in a soil mite, it's gonna struggle, okay? Liverworts, mosses, unless they're distinctive, it's going to have trouble, okay? So don't, um, it, it's not, you can't just believe everything it says. It's very, ama it's amazing for birds because there's so many bird photos that it has to work with. So that's it. Um, you'll notice I haven't typed a single thing. Um, I just tapped on places and I'm gonna submit these five observations. So I just hit the submit button and uh, and we're done. Okay, and as I said, you could have done a lot more observations than that. And when you're doing the city nature challenge, you could photograph everything in sight. And so there they are. And if I go now to one of those, you can see it's now made a page for it. And it's mapped it quite, well, let's see, fairly precisely. You can tell, yeah, how precisely by how wide the circle is. So that's pretty, that's within a five meter radius. and. Uh, We'll see uh, what people say. Somebody will probably come in and, and verify that observation quite possibly before this talk is finished. So that's the uploads. Um, the last thing I thought I'd do then, and before I'm happy to answer some questions and because I'm sure I've left some things out. The last thing I'll do is I'll just talk a little bit about some of the conservation uh, uh, e examples of how we've been using this in conservation. And, and speaking of which I should say that if a species is sensitive to poaching or persecution, then iNaturalist will automatically obscure its location. So you see how this is very precisely mapped. You wouldn't want to do that with um, species that people might want to, to catch or, um, or harm, like rattlesnakes and things like that. And so iNaturalist automatically would, would put the, the, lo the location inside a much bigger box. It would actually draw a box about this big right around the Belcara Peninsula, and it would put it in a random location so everybody could tell it isn't the real location. Okay, um, so, all right, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch back to um, PowerPoint. It seemed to be happier when I didn't jump directly from one to the next. So hang on, I'm really tempting fate, Danica, on my hot spotted phone here, switching back and forth. <laughs> but oh, we we'll appreciate see. it. <laughs> I'll just see if I can get, Get away with one last switcheroo here. So uh, as Danica mentioned, um, uh, I'm the chair of the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. This is the group of volunteer scientists from across the country who decide which species of plants and animals are uh, threatened with extinction. Okay, And we are appointed by the uh, federal minister of the environment to do that. And then the minister of the environment decides whether to protect them or not under our Species at Risk Act. So we're the ones who say that you know, Pacific humpback whales are special concern, meaning they're not quite threatened. And we're the ones who say that peregrine falcon is now not at risk, big success story of people who brought them back. We're the ones who say that Southern resident killer whales are, are endangered and they probably always will be because their populations are never going to be very high. So here's an example that I thought was kind of fun. This was one of the first meetings I um, chaired and uh, American bumblebee. And I always think with an, a name like American bumblebee shouldn't possibly be threatened with extinction. It sounds common to me, um, but it's not. We said it was special concern, meaning it could become threatened in a short period of time if something bad happens. Well, how do we know? It's so rare that there's no good population surveys for it year after year. You can't put data together that show a decline or stability. But instead, you can go to Bumblebee Watch which is like iNaturalist, but it's for bumblebees. It's just specific to bumblebees. And all these green dots, I hope you can see them. Sorry, I should have gone onto my full screen here. There we go. The green dots are um, locations where people have uploaded a verified photo of a bumblebee. And experts went in and verified them. Uh, and you can see that it's the status of American bumblebee. It's found uh, just on the up to the edge of the Canadian Shield. It's only in Ontario, uh, in Canada at least. It's found south of the border. And we've got some in the Toronto area along the Great Lakes and down maybe to uh, 
and, you know, down to Norfolk County and so on. So those are the distributions. And we put that kind of information together with other bits and pieces of, of evidence to suggest it's special concern. But the interesting thing is once, you know, that I mean, people are going crazy with iNaturalist, they're also going crazy with the plight of the bumblebee. And so you put those two things together with the fact that a high profile uh, assessment was done saying it's special concern and people are now starting to really watch for it. And so if you go to iNaturalist, I did, this is a fairly recent sc screenshot. In fact, there's another 187 research grade observations in iNaturalist. And look at how people have expanded the known range of this thing. It's up near Ottawa now. Um, it's uh, going right down into Essex County, um, much bigger range. Uh, there's a lot of observations and, and this is exactly the kind of information we need uh, for deciding on a status. So when we reassess this species, in, in re, which we're supposed to do every 10 years, um, this is this is going to drive the assessment. I'm convinced of it. It's going to be this plus expert opinion plus museum specimens. This is how we're going to know whether it's threatened or not. So they haven't really increased in number, by the way. It's just that the number of observations have increased because people are using INAT a lot. So we'll have to deal with that. There's going to be some bias toward um, an appearance of more of them. But now we know they have a much bigger distribution in Canada than we realized. So that's one example. Um, this is another one that um, I kind of like because uh, I had a I was somewhat involved. This is a I don't know if you ever imagine there is such a thing as an Olympic Peninsula millipede. It's found from the Olympic Peninsula up toward Banfield on the west coast of Vancouver Island, known from some ancient, some old museum specimens. And uh, and this is Carmana Walburn Provincial Park, the project in iNaturalist. I took a class of students there a few years ago that I was teaching in Banfield. So we uh, braved the logging roads and drove for three hours and camped there for a couple of nights. And, and naturally, me being me, I gave them all an assignment that involved iNaturalist. And so here they are, they broke into teams and they had a sort of a friendly competition between each other, see who could get the most species, the most rare species and so on. And um, little did I know what I was unleashing on an unsuspecting flora and fauna of an old growth forest. Uh, they were even eye netting at night in the rain, trying to find things with their headlamps. And, uh, you know, we again, you throw that kind of enthusiasm in and good things will always happen. And this was a good thing. So this is the Olympic Peninsula millipede. Uh, these are my photos. I thought it was a yellow spotted millipede, the one that, that we have commonly boldly wandering around uh, at this time of year and, and in the fall, well, through the summer. Um, they're bold because they, they, they've got some chemical defenses and some yellow dots to warn predators, bad idea to eat me. I thought they, that's what these were because uh, I never didn't know there was another millipede that looked like it. But of course, Mr. Millipede saw this on iNaturalist, somebody from the States and said, no, 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 no. That is an Olympic uh, Peninsula millipede. And, and in fact, it was the first one that had ever been uploaded to the site iNaturalist. And here are our observations. Now, it was known from that region, but it had never gone on to iNaturalist. The, the reason this is relevant to conservation is, is may surprise you. It's, it's because Kosiewicz, the Committee on Status of Endangered Wildlife, um, had been considering whether or not it would be a good idea to um, uh, do a status report on this species and because they thought it could be threatened with extinction. It, they knew it was rare and uh, it's an old growth seems to be an old growth specialist and we haven't been very kind to old growth forest as you know in this province uh, we're down to 2.7 um, percent uh, productive old growth forest and evidently um, some people think that's too much and so it that would not be a good sign for something like this um, but when they saw these observations um, uh, they thought, well, hang on, they're, maybe they're not that uncommon. And I happened to be in the room when people were looking at it. And I said, oh, yeah, they're all over the place. And, and of course, they're in a protected park. And so they said, OK, no, this is not a priority. So it, it had been a priority. It was on the hit list of potential species that the arthropod specialists wanted to look at. But they changed their mind uh, it, it, once they saw that it's not that uncommon. And um, they were right with hindsight, because last summer, I was near Bamfield and uh, I parked in a, in a parking lot in a, in a third growth forest, like, you know, not old growth at all. And there was one right in the parking lot. 
So it's doing fine. It's not worth our attention. There's more important priorities to worry about. So the last one I'll mention is this beautiful insect. It's a grapple tail. And uh, this is the status report that Kosiewicz um, did on this species. And before this one was going to be assessed, um, my friend Brian Starzonsky said, hey, we should go look for these things. And, uh, and so, of course, we did. And so what we were able to do is, first of all, you could look at iNaturalist. And here was an, here's a record of one. Um, and it's in uh, sort of north of um, uh, Mission in a, in a provincial park by somebody named Jeremy Gatton. A tremendous naturalist on, from Vancouver Island. So we thought, okay, well, that, that's good to know. We need to survey that. And so Jeremy came over uh, with Brian and also with Jennifer Heron, who is a, a, an invertebrate specialist with the provincial government. And we went on a hunt for grapple tails. And here we are at a, um, two different sites. And as soon as we walked up to the creek here, uh, we saw one. And this one here it, is in a provincial park. Um, it was the first time it had been seen in 40 years. It was reported once 40 years ago, never again, and we found 18 of them uh, just in a short walk along the stream. Then we went to uh, bushwhacked into a creek that was clearly completely wrong habitat. They really need you know, faster flowing water, open creeks, little cascades, and so on. And this was all choked up and boggy and completely unsuitable. Uh, but nobody told the grapple tail that, that uh, we found. And so here, uh, Jeremy and I are um, photographing one up in the trees here. So we found a new site for Canada. And the, the result of all of this was that now, if you go to the naturalist, people are piling into these places, looking for them, finding out how long they, they fly for, and uh, lots of people are dropping in on them. And uh, and the result was that we had a much stronger assessment when Kasuik decided it was special concern. It's in some protected areas. It's probably not in not threatened with extinction. Uh, not a lot of threats in these locations, some of them. And so it's just ticking along. It's something you, you want to keep an eye on. But uh, thanks to community science, there are a lot of eyes on this on this insect. So I'll leave it at that. And, and I mean, maybe I can set you up, Danica. I don't know what you were going to say, but I just wanted to say that, you know, for the Tri-Cities Challenge, it, um, see it, photograph it, upload it, and most importantly, have fun. And as I've said to other people, if you're not having fun, uh, then you're doing it wrong. So it should be fun. And, uh, and th that's certainly why I do it. So I'll stop it there and um, turn it back over to you, Danica. Thank you so much for sharing all of that really great information about the different parts of iNaturalist and how to upload things, especially uploading group pictures from your computer can be a really great way to sort of use your time efficiently when you're out observing. Um, we're going to have time now for questions. So again, if anyone has questions for John, you can pop those into the chat, uh, either here or on Facebook Live and check in both. Um, and while we wait for questions to come in, I'll sort of talk a little bit about what the City Nature Challenge is. So. Because you've all signed up for this um, webinar tonight, I assume you all know a little bit about it, but just to reiterate, the City Nature Challenge is a global biodiversity challenge where cities from literally across the entire world compete over a four day period in the spring to see how many um, different species they can see in their city uh, during that four day period. And it's pretty remarkable how many folks contribute during those four days. You know, you can look on iNaturalist and see how many observations are submitted every day. And there is an enormous spike in observations around the four day weekend of the City Nature Challenge. So it's a pretty cool event to be part of. And we're really excited that this year, um, for the first time ever, we've got the entire Greater Vancouver region signed up to participate, which means that no matter where you are in Greater Vancouver, anywhere from you know, the, the beaches out by UBC, all the way out to Pitt Meadows and, um, you know, the Pitt Addington Marsh or down on the river near Surrey, anywhere you are in the greater Vancouver region, your observations on iNaturalist will get counted and contribute to our, our tally, you know, and we'll see how well we rank against other cities around the world. But much more importantly, we'll contribute to different citizen science initiatives and um, science initiatives like the ones that John has been talking about. So you're welcome to head out on your own, 
take pictures on your own, make your observations on your own um, with family, with friends around your neighborhood in different parks around Greater Vancouver. You're also welcome to come uh, join us on one of our four guided nature walks. They're all free. Um, you can find out more information about them on our website. I'll pop a link in the chat. Um, we've got a page with information about the four different uh, walks that we're leading. We'll be in Pitt Addington Marsh, we'll be at Minicata in Coquitlam, and we'll also be on Bray Island in Langley. So if you'd like a little help um, figuring out what you're looking at or you know, gaining some confidence when you're out in the field, you're welcome to come join us on one of those uh, walks. And we'd love to have you there. So it looks like we've got our first um, question. Thanks, Karen. So the question is, ID platforms I have used are iBird and Plant PlantNet, and can these other platforms interface with iNaturalist? Yeah, it's a good question, uh, Karen. I'm glad you asked because it's uh, something I forgot to mention. Uh, the, the answer is no, um, that those are standalone um, platforms. I use eBird as well all the time. and um, but eBird, and I'm not sure about PlantNet, but eBird and iNaturalist and Bumblebee Watch and all, a lot of these other ones, and the Christmas bird counts, those are all, those all go to a central database uh, called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So there is actually a mothership of, of, of community science and other kinds of surveys uh, where then anybody can download the data from there. So they all go up to a, to a different place. And then in that way, they meet, they meet in, the, in the mothership of G, GBIF, um, uh, but they don't, but iNaturalist and eBird, I mean, it would be great. It would be very sensible if, if they could cross talk immediately. The other thing is that um, eBird, you don't have to have photos, um, right? It's just, a, it can be just a checklist of the things you've seen. Um, and so um, when I take a photo of a bird, I put it onto both. I just, cause I enjoy playing with, um, photography. So I, I put them on to both iNaturalist and eBird, but you could just choose one and it's still going to be available uh, to scientists and members of the public. That's a great question. Thanks, Karen. Mm -hmm. well, well, I'll give you another minute or two to see if we have any other questions from the group. Um, but, you know, I think you've given us such a great overview of, of the ways that we can use iNaturalist. It's going to be really exciting to see how many uh, folks get out and, and participate in the next weekend. The City Nature Challenge, I don't think I mentioned this, but it's running from April 29th to May 2nd. So not this weekend, but the next one. So it's coming up on us. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to share uh, maybe in the chat if they've um, used iNaturalist before or if anyone's planning on heading out next weekend to, to make some observations. I know I'll be out. Yeah. And the, the fun thing about that is that because it's based on projects, the same kinds of geogra uh, geographic locations I just mentioned, um, there's nothing special that you really have to join in particular. You just you know need to have any, a free uh, iNaturalist account and upload, upload your photos and they'll, um, the um, Nature Challenge people will pick it up. And they'll, they'll appear in the right place automatically. Yeah. It's, it's uh... amazing how many there, people have really gotten behind this this year. I think in the past, it was only Surrey. Richmond did it for the first time last year. Uh, Delta, I think. Um, and now suddenly, um, Tri Cities are all joining forces together. The three Tri Cities, and um, I think their main objective is to uh, see more species than Surrey. But um, <laughs> I can't speak on their behalf. <clears throat> yeah, it's pretty exciting and it'll be exciting to see, um, you know, if there's any differences between the cities or how the Metro Vancouver area kind of ranks as a whole compared to other parts of, uh, of the world, other, you know, big mm -hmm. cities as well. Mm -hmm. Just because it's a city doesn't mean we don't have biodiversity. There's plenty to see even within urban parks here. Mm -hmm. Well, it looks like we don't have uh, any questions from the group. So, uh, we may wrap up then. Um, and thanks again so much, John. Oh, here we go. We have uh, someone from the chat saying they're hoping to start an iNaturalist community event in Taiwan, which is yes. awesome. So hi, thanks. Crystal. Yeah, that would be great. I hope you, I hope you pull it off. Um, Crystal, I don't know how, um, I, I don't know how popular iNaturalist is in Taiwan yet, but that's, uh, 
Yeah, that's great to hear from you. Yeah, it just takes one person to start it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again so much for joining us, everyone, tonight. And thank you, uh, Dr. John Reynolds, for um, teaching us so many interesting things about iNaturalist. I'm very excited for the City Nature Challenge next weekend. Uh, once again, if you want to learn more about the City Nature Challenge, you can follow that link I put in the uh, chat. Otherwise, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. I'm going to, yeah, end the recording now. So thanks again so much, everyone. Thank have you, Danica. Night. Okay, bye-bye.